Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the book of Genesis, a line-by-line study of the first book of the Sacred Scriptures. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to one of my favorite moments of the entire week. I just love doing these studies. We're going to pick up in Genesis. We're still in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. On the sixth day of creation, the Lord makes man. and And it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Right, male and female, he created them. This is the solemn introduction of humanity. Now, us, this who's who's talking here? Why does God refer to himself in the plural? Now, some some writers in literature and a lot of commentators will say that this is the the royal we. Even some documents written by the popes or kings or leaders sometimes uses the royal we. You know, it has come to our attention, and we have to make a decision. That that royal we in literature is the idea that royalty is chosen by God and speaks alongside God, and that it's it's also like the royal family um, is speaking all the way back, you know, in time with previous generations. Like like the person speaking doesn't speak alone. Like their their entire you know, heritage is speaking with them. Uh, there's a uh, several historical examples of this. King Edward the Seventh once wrote, "Now we, Edward, by the grace of God, King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and of the British dominions beyond the seas, blah 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 blah. Um, uh, we we have arrived at the following decision upon the questions in dispute which have been referred to our arbitration blah 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 right throughout this entire exchange king edward uses the we well that that's possible but the problem with that is that god does not speak throughout all of the old testament using the royal we this is one of the only places where he speaks of himself using this this plural in this sense. Now remember the name Elohim, the the word God, the generic name for God, Elohim, is in itself plural. Okay, so that's interesting. Some Jewish commentators believe God is speaking with the animals. Let us make man in our image, meaning in the image of animals and in the image of God together. Well, since humanity is flesh like an animal and it is soul like a god or like God, I mean, I guess that's possible. And there are some commentators that believe God is speaking to the angels um, because the angels are like the instruments of, of, of his making, of his creation, of his bara. But most Christians see this very, very clearly as the Trinity. In fact, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, said, God is either deceiving or amusing us in speaking plurally, if he is the one and only singular. Or was it to the angels he spoke as the Jews interpret the passage? Because these also acknowledge not the Son. They don't acknowledge the Son. Nay, it was because he already had his Son close at his hand as as his second person. His own word, and the third person also, the spirit in the word in the word. Let us make an in our image and become one of us. For with whom did did he make man? And to whom did he make him like? The answer must be the Son on one hand, who was one day to put on human nature, and the Spirit on the other hand, who was to sanctify human nature. With these did he then speak in the unity of the Trinity. Now that comes from Tertullian, very, very early in church history. And I believe it's the first time, if I'm not mistaken, 
that the word Trinity, that, that title is actually even used. So Christian theo theologians have seen this as a clear preparation for God revealing this idea of the Trinity. Elohim is plural, and here God speaks in the plural. This is huge. God is three persons. Three persons. What is a person? What is a person? Now, according to philosophy and theology, a person is an individual who is distinct, but at the same time is in relationship with other like persons. Right? So there's a group of persons, but the individual is a person within that community. And a person has intelligent thoughts and has free will to make choices. A person has the capacity to determine morality, what's right from wrong. A person has abstract and imaginative creative thoughts. And a person can communicate with other persons one way or another. So we say the Trinity is three distinct persons of God, a trinity of persons in the unity of the nature of God. And the human person is created like the God persons because our soul, our spirit, our personhood is in the image and likeness of God. But we're different from God in that we have physical bodies. We have a created body, but we're like God in, in our thoughts, in our morality, in our free will, in our personhood, right? Um, St. Pope John Paul II said, a human person is a body among bodies. We are body persons, an embodied spirit who is created in the image and likeness of God. And God is love. God is relationship. So we're created body and soul. With this dual personhood, mankind is placed above the other created beings. Now, it's very important that we understand Catholic theology is very clear that the human body is not a, I mean, I mean the human person is not a soul trapped in a body. Right? The body is not evil. The body is not particularly bad. We are both body and soul. We're created body and soul together, fused together. And in the resurrection, in, in the resurrected life of heaven, we will have a resurrected body and soul together. That's how humans are meant to be. Eve Ray, explaining Pope John Paul, says, humans do not have a body, they are flesh body, right? Humans do not have a spirit, they are a spirit. Our bodies are not extraneous to what we are. This is why the personhood of the Trinity is such an important idea. Since God is already a community of persons, the creation of humanity is not out of some lack of fellowship within God. Like God is not lonely. God is already a community, a communion of persons. He creates us to share in his divine life, to share his glory and his grace. Amen? Now, the word man, mankind, humankind, is Adam. And it's very interesting. Adam is Adam. It's, it's not really a name. It means the entire species of humankind, Adam. And it's very interesting that Adam has within it blood, right? Blood is the word dam, dam. So the Adam has dam filling it. That's what makes him a living being. On one hand, he's a living being because he is filled with blood, with dam, with life blood. On the other hand, he's going to be filled with the spirit, with the soul. This is so amazing. 
So it's interesting. God, God says, let us make humankind, right? He doesn't say, let us make one man. He says, let us make the corporate plural, not singular, not individual. Let us make the species of mankind, just as the species of animals have been made. Let them have dominion. Right. So in this first story of creation, the question is asked, were many humans made or were just two? Was there a whole race of humans made or just Adam and Eve? Well, in chapter two, we're going to see it talk specifically about Adam and Eve. But theologians talk about this as polygenism versus monogenism. Polygenism is multiple persons of origin, right? Many people origin. And monogenism is one person origin or one couple origin. Pope Pius XII said about a hundred years or more ago, he said, there's no way we can believe in polygenism and then many other scholars have said, well, maybe we can believe in polygenism. But here's the, the theological debate. This is what concerns theologians and, and the popes and, and people much smarter than I am. It's the whole idea of the transmission of original sin. And if, if Adam and Eve are not literally the first people, how would original sin get passed on to all the rest of humanity, right? So what we have to believe basically as, as Catholics, we have to believe that God created and that God created the souls. Now we're gonna take a deep dive into this in later sessions, okay? But for now, let's, let's look at, still at the image and the likeness. Image and likeness, these are words used for offspring or of sonship. Adam is the firstborn son. Notice that no other animal or, or plant, nothing else in creation is given this dignity. This is the dignity of the human person. So what is this image and likeness? It's, it's, like, it's like the Trinity, distinct but in relationship with other persons, intelligent thoughts, free will, the capacity to determine right and wrong, all the rest. And more like the relationship of God is three persons, not any one person of the Trinity, right? As St. Thomas Aquinas said, man is like God in his soul. Therefore, the soul was created in his likeness. And, and what I mean by we're, we're created in the likeness of God in, in the sense of relationship is like the Trinity is three that are really one. Mankind is created so that the two are one. And actually all of the church is one. All of mankind will be one in a sense. Does that make sense? Like the Trinity is three in one where really there's really one one nature, but three persons, that's the way that we are created in the image and likeness of God. We have the human nature, but we have multiple individuals, multiple persons. And also like God, once a human soul is created, once a spirit is, is birthed, it's, it's bara, right? It's created. The soul does not die. The human soul is, is eternal. That's also imaging God. And also, along with God, the human has the desire and the nature to expand love, to share life, to make more life. We'll dig into this a little bit more in a later session. All Catholic teaching on social justice springs from this, the dignity of the human person. All people have dignity of life and freedom and fairness and justice and peace. 
It all flows from the dignity of the human person. This is why the Catholic Church has taught communism, Marxism, totalitarian governments are intrinsically evil. They do not dignify the human person. They do not allow for freedom. They are not fair or just. They are part of the very fabric of belief that people are pitted against each other. People are divided. People are enemies, right? And some people deserve death. That's what almost all of these totalitarian regimes believe, communism, Marxism. Some people deserve death. That is at odds with Catholic teaching because we have dignity created in the, in the image and likeness of God. Um, we're, we're not necessarily made for earth. We're not necessarily made for Jackson, Michigan. That's where, where we are from. The earth and Jackson, Michigan was made for us. Do we get that? We're really not meant for here forever. Heaven is the forever. The whole purpose of life on earth is to prepare us for eternal life in heaven. It gives us a chance, kind of like a dating relationship and an engagement, to see if we're really ready for the wedding banquet of the Lamb. This life is not just a test. It's not just pass-fail. Think of it as an engagement, getting us ready for the eternal wedding. Amen? Doesn't that just blow your mind? Yeah. So mankind is given dominion over the things of the earth, not, not just power over things, but responsibility for the stewardship, responsibility for the good use, right? Responsibility for the ongoing use. This is a sign of kingship. We're given kingly authority. Steve Ray says this it does not give us the freedom to abuse, exploit, or raise the earth. We are right and just to cultivate and to use resources, but not to their total use and abuse. We must replenish, regrow, reuse, renew. Now, this idea that the whole world was made for us, that's not a very popular thought in today's culture. Where there are those that believe that human beings are parasites and a cancer on the planet. And that is not the Christian or the Jewish or, or, or even the Muslim point of view. We're not parasites. The world was made for us. So this image that mankind has created male and female together, like this is so interesting. They're only human. They're only in God's image when there is a communion of persons. When the male and the female, who are not the exact same, they're both different. One is not better than the other. Male is not female, female is not male, yet together they're the image of God in relationship. Why are they like God in, 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 in his identity is in, 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 and his likeness? I'm so excited I can't speak, right? Because God is a trinity in unity. God did not create man a solitary individual being. From the beginning, God has created us as a communion between persons, a common union, a relationship. Now, this is very interesting. The Hebrew words male and female, in Hebrew, male is zakar, and female is nechaba, nechaba, and zakar. Zakar, male, also means to remember to recall, to call to mind. It's kind of like a symbol. So a male, a zakar, we might say, is to symbolize God, to call to mind God. And nechaba, right, the nechaba, the female, that also means to pierce, to perforate, to bear, or to appoint. 
So a female, we might say, is to appoint more of the symbols of God, to expand more, to, to bear more symbols. Isn't that fascinating? So humanity is made an icon and, and, and appointed as a symbol bearing God's very image. Isn't that just absolutely awesome? Now, notice this. The church has a solid voice that life begins at conception. Okay, the church is solid with this. Again, this comes from our friend Tertullian, who, who is writing, he died around 240, I believe. So he's just writing at the, at the beginning of the second or the third century, right? He's writing at the beginning of the third century. This is what Tertullian writes. How then is a living being conceived is the substance of both body and soul formed together at one and the same time? Or does one of them proceed from the other? Uh, or does one of them proceed the other? In other words, does the body or the soul come first? Does the soul or the body come first? We need to maintain that they are both conceived and formed perfectly simultaneously, as well as born together. And that... Not a moment's interval occurs in either. Now we allow that life begins with conception because we contend that the soul also begins from conception. Life taking its commencement at the same moment and the same place that the soul does. Okay, this guy is a student of the disciples' students, right? I mean, he, he would have not just come to this conclusion on his own. This had been taught. This had been revealed. It's the first time we see it in writing. But this is super early. The church has believed this from the beginning. Life begins at conception because that's when the human soul enters into that physical body. So why does God create humanity? Remember the pagan stories? They all talk about God wanted servants or lovers or friends or entertainment, right? There's a very interesting book called God, a biography. It's by an author named Jack Miles. And he looks at the Old Testament more from a literary standpoint. So not so much as a believer. This isn't like theology. But he has some really great statements. It's kind of like a critical literary look at the, at at God through through the lens of the Bible um, from 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 kind of a secular point of view. But this book has some really interesting insights. He wrote this at this point: God is not to judge from anything he says a God who wants love or worship or anything that can be easily named. He wants an image, but then why should he want this? At this point, we can only guess. That's what Jack Miles says. We can only guess. Steve Ray says, God was not compelled to create. There was no need, no deficit. He was not lonely. There was no need to create for reciprocal love. Why did he create? St. John the Evangelist tells us God is love. And in God's image and likeness, we're made by love and we're made for love. Father James Kubicki has written a few books. He's really wonderful. Father James says, we're made to know God's love and to love in return. And if we truly love God, then we will love what God loves, which is our neighbors. Such love is possible only so far as it originates in the heart of God, who is love. So why did God create humanity because love isn't love unless it's given away. Love isn't love unless it multiplies. Love by its very nature wants to grow and expand and spread out and share and deeply invest in each other. 
and God blessed them. And in verse 28, he gives the, the first humans, he gives them the first commandment. He, 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 he tells them the first marching orders. Be fruitful and multiply. This is the first covenant between God and humankind. Now, Genesis does not technically, specifically call the union of Adam and Eve a covenant. Marriage is not technically called a covenant in Genesis, but the rabbis began teaching way before Jesus that it is the first covenant. And Jesus points back to the original marriage of Adam and Eve when he talks about divorce. When he says that basically two people cannot be separated if God joined them together because he joined them together in covenant. There are many roots to this in the Bible, but among the clearest is from the prophet Malachi. Malachi is talking about how Israel has walked away from the Lord and, and broken their side of the covenant, which makes the Lord so sad, right? In Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, the Lord says, why does, or, or he says, why does the Lord not receive the sacrifices and look with favor on the offerings? And Malachi says, because the Lord was witness to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your, compa your companion and your wife by covenant. So th this is a loaded image. He's not only talking about the covenant between man and woman. He's talking about the covenant between humanity and God. And in Malachi, it calls this specifically, clearly titles it a covenant. Now, if you've read anything about covenants from um, Dr. Scott Hahn or uh, Brant Petrie or John Bergsma or any systematic theology or ecclesiology, this union with Adam and Eve and God is always referred to as the first covenant. Okay, I've been talking about covenants for a while now. What's a covenant? So a covenant is kind of like a contract or an agreement, yet it's not so much like a contract or an agreement. It is so much more. A contract is an exchange of goods and services. A covenant is an exchange of life that makes family, that builds the kingdom of heaven. And a covenant can never be broken. And the first commandment of this first covenant given to humanity is be fruitful and multiply. Go create more humans. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough and make this clear enough for the crazy things happening in our world since the sexual revolution in the 60s. But it didn't start then. It started from the beginning of time. But the greatest power given to humankind is the power to recreate more humankind, to co-create humans, right? God the creator creates another creator who can create other creators. The power to co-create has been given to us. All the future covenants hinge on the expansion of people. The marriage is going to expand into family, is going to expand into community, is going to expand into kingdom, is going to expand into nations. All the future events hinge on this idea that people are meant to create more people. Not by themselves, through the God-given power of fruitfulness. And God does not say multiply until you've reached a magic number of six billion people. Then the earth will be overcrowded and, and, and we need to get rid of a few. That's not what he says. There seems to be no limit in the expansion that God desires. That's very important to see. 
Humanity is given permission also to eat plant life, it appears. It, it looks like at first we're vegetarians. And God found it very good. Huh. Is it troublesome that God never separately says people are very good? Nah, nah. I think it's the harmony of all that world, of all that creation and humankind. The harmony between that is what's very good. This very good world is in a state of original holiness, with original justice and original beauty. And then as we turn into chapter two, this is a terrible page break, or chapter break rather, a terrible chapter break. I'll, um, I'll talk more about that next time. But God rested on the seventh day. Seven is a Hebrew word, Shabbat. Shabbat means seven, but Shabbat also means to make an oath or a covenant. So to Shabbat yourself is to seven yourself. And the number seven, the seventh day, is a day of oath or covenant. So to Shabbat is to seven oneself. Right? Do we get that? We get that connection? And connected to this is the Hebrew word Shabbat. Right? The day of seven, the day of Shabbat, the day of oath is the Shabbat. Shabbat, the Sabbath, means to desist, to, yeah, desist, to stop, to cease, freeze. Now, God himself doesn't need to rest or desist. This is a gift that he's giving to humanity. He doesn't rest out of exhaustion. There's not been a hint of any exertion for all his hard work. The other days were somehow made for the Sabbath. St. Pope John Paul II made it, made it very clear, this is not some kind of divine inactivity. It's not a vacation where, where God gets tired and he needs a break. And Jesus, when he was questioned about working on the Sabbath, he made it very clear in John chapter 5, my father is working still. And that's why I'm working, is basically what he's saying. So what is this rest? God is not resting in the way we think of taking a nap. He's lingering with the gaze of joyous delight at what he just made. He's lingering among his creation, with his creation. He wants Adam and Eve to enter into the fullness of what he just brought about. And God made this day holy. He hallowed it. The Hebrew word is kadash or kadash. Holy, sanctified, hallowed. It's the only time holy is used in the entire book of Genesis and the first time it shows up ever in the Bible. And it's talking about a period of time. The day of Shabbat is Kadesh, right? Now, since God made man on the sixth day, humanity's first full day is the Shabbat. The Sabbath day, the day of rest. Adam and Eve are called to rest in the Sabbath before they ever work a day. Like, do we, do we catch that? The seven, the Shabbat, the Shabbat becomes a sacred number and a day of completion, a day of covenant. Six becomes a symbolic number that's just shy of perfection. The number six misses the mark. It misses something. It's disordered. Later in the Bible, the number six is going to come up to represent evil. Now, notice on the seventh day, it never says evening came, morning followed the next day. It's as if the seventh day never ends. Because we're actually called to live 
in the Shabbat, in the covenant, in the oath, in the seven. The book of Hebrews calls this God's rest. It's a huge ongoing theme. The Sabbath is a sign of God's covenant to humanity. Now, way later in Exodus chapter 20, when Moses is, is called you know, out, of, <laughs> out of Egypt with the people, after slavery, the Lord God makes that Sabbath day a commandment. It becomes a command. The Navarre Study Bible says, it's as if the rhythm of time were being broken by the Sabbath, prefiguring the situation in which mankind will enjoy an unending rest, an eternal feast in God's presence. In the language of the Bible, feast or festival means Three things. It means an obligation from rest, from everyday work. It, it, work. it means recognition of God as Lord of creation and, and, and a joyful contemplation of what he made. And three, it's a foretaste of the enduring rest and joy that will be man's after he leaves the earth. The feasts, the festivals, the Shabbat, the oath, it's all about the enduring life that we're going to have after. Earlier we talked about um, time and eternity, er earlier uh, meaning the last session. God's love and his existence is, is outside of the limits of time. Shabbat is our opportunity to taste timelessness, to taste eternity and perfection. I really want you to sit with that. There's a, a beautiful sister named Sister Mary Michael Fox, who just, oh my goodness, I love, I love her talks, I love her writing. Um, We've seen her before at uh, some of the, the conferences at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And Sister Mary Michael Fox says, if you don't learn to stop and soak in his love and step out of the rat race and step out of time, if we don't learn to do that, we will lose our taste for it and forget what the whole goal is in our life. The goal is not a huge retirement fund. Our goal is heaven, eternity with God. The Shabbat takes us to this place of timelessness, to enter into prayer, to enter into a taste of eternity. Isn't that so cool? That's Sabbath. Shabbat, that's seven, uh, Shabbat, right? The oath, the covenant, isn't this awesome? I can't wait to see you next time as we continue with our march through the book of Exodus. It's going really fast, isn't it? We're whipping through the, the, the verses now, folks. See you next time. Thanks. God bless. Thank you so much for walking with us through this study of the book of Genesis.